Well, welcome everyone to the conference on supply chains. We're going to start in just a couple of minutes. I'll leave just a moment because I know we still have people entering the session and then I'll, I'll kick us off. Okay. Okay, we have uh, we have a few people on. Let's uh, let's begin our session. So, hello, uh, welcome uh, to this panel on supply chains. I'm Nicholas Redman. I'm the director of analysis at Oxford Analytica which is a geopolitical analysis firm established in 1975 to leverage the expertise of Oxford and other universities uh, to help decision makers in government or business um, to deal with what's happening, why it's happening and where it's going. Uh, we published uh, every business day since September 1984. Last night, I ran a search to see how many times we've mentioned supply chains uh, in this calendar year, and it was 600 times. I then did a search for the year, the same period of 2019, and it was 403. So I think this difference is emblematic of the increased interest in and the increased anxiety around supply chains this year as a result of the disruption caused by COVID-19 and the government responses to it. And that's why I think this panel today is so uh, timely and important. Now, without further ado, let me introduce your panel for today. Hugo Roppel is an entrepreneur with various companies in logistics and transportation. And he's the owner and founder of Gill Norm, the Geneva International Logistics Norm, which is specialized in developing and documenting best practice solutions for the supply chain. Hugo, give us a wave. Hello. <laughs> Alexander Maliket is the president of the Canadian consultancy Opus Advisory Services International, and he serves on numerous boards and advisory bodies, including as a member of the Board of Global Trade Professionals Alliance, deputy head of the executive committee, ICC Banking Commission, and founding partner of ESG Validation LLP in London. Jean-Francois Genest has worked for 35 years in aerospace and defense, including 10 years as vice president, chief scientist at Airbus. And he's now the head of WARPA, which is pushing disruptive innovation in aerospace and defense. Jean-Francois, give us a wave. Hello. Just so everybody knows everybody else. Karim al Kassir finally, is an entrepreneur focused mainly on artificial intelligence, fintech, and decentralization. He's the CEO and founder of Mentor Lycon, which develops intelligent technology, commerce and finance platforms, and is active in Russia and the Middle East, and now looking at Africa and Europe. I thought I would start us off today with three questions for our panel and ask each one and then go around and then go to the second and then the third. So the first question is this, and I'd like to start off uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Hugo, please. Um, are supply chains actually broken? Or is this too definitive a statement masking differences by sector and a failure to appreciate that supply chains are constantly evolving and subject to a range of pressures? If you consider the prospect of a tech separation between US and China in the next year or two, however, should we be worrying about breakages in the near future? Hugo. I guess uh, the past has shown uh, that uh, due to different reasons, we have to diversify the supply chain. So single sourcing uh, is probably uh, of the past. Uh, we had a situation that very often uh, the cheapest one, and I'm consulting also my clients, uh, which are doing that already out of security reasons uh, for years, to have for the same commodity, different suppliers, in different areas in the world. So that gives them a mix of your costs, but you do not depend on one country and one area. Uh, it was interesting due to the political changes in America. We were, especially when we started to talk about uh, this session, we were very much concerned about political interference into the supply chain. Uh, I guess the future will be different than the past. And uh, all of a sudden, we had this COVID situation, which showed us, too, that uh, besides a new factor, a very strong factor of political interference, we may have, as we have seen now with COVID, 
other interferences in, in supply chain. So proximity, of course, uh, actually was good. On the other hand, I believe also that uh, we have a very good supply chain execution industry, which adopts to the various uh, situations uh, which are coming and uh, uh, mentioning, uh, especially with China, having in the future also the uh, railroad, uh, because we always uh, talk about the road, but it's also the railways which is built through this, uh, which is functioning. Mm -hmm. And for example, we flew in over the last couple of months machines to produce masks, a security, and an M. And on the railroad, we took in the material in, in, in containers, which were perfectly and marvelous. So I think we are adjusting uh, to these uh, problematics quite good within the industry. Uh, thanks, Hugo. Alexander, same question to you. Is everything broken? Thank you, Nick. Uh, no, so look, I, I'm uh, an eternal optimist, so I would it, almost uh, by definition fall on the side of a no on that broad of a question. Well, I do think uh, when panels like this are planned and articulated, some of the statements are authored to make the discussion provocative, and I think this achieves that end. Um, in my world, we think of supply chains on at least three levels. We think about the physical supply chain, which is the log logistics, the movement of goods, all of the sorts of things that one naturally thinks about. We think about the financial supply chain, which is all the liquidity that under underpins all of the trade and actually enables it. According to WTO, actually enables 80 to 90 percent of merchandise trade flows. So we think about that financial aspect and the risk mitigation aspect. And then finally, we think about the digital and data flow aspect of the supply chain. And so if you take that kind of holistic definition, um, I think if I had to summarize the situation, I would say that supply chains are bending but not broken at this, po at this point. I mean, there are a number of dynamics at play from the geopolitics of trade wars and some rather self-serving and uh, short-term sort of visions about how trade works and how it's a win-lose proposition and how it's uh, one of those sort of self-interested kind of political dynamics. To, to other perspectives that look at things a little bit more holistically and look at things a little bit more collaboratively and really think about trade in the classical sort of comparative absolute advantage view of economics that says, you know, we, we both do better if we trade and we both do the things that we're better at. Um, so I think when you, when you start to paint the picture a little bit that way, uh, it's almost, um, you know, you take a bit of a lens backward into history and you say, look, supply chains are commercial communities that can involve hundreds, multiple hundreds, maybe even tens of thousands of suppliers with an anchor buyer, a whole set of communities of service companies that make those supply chains work. Um, so no, I wouldn't say they're broken at this point. I think that COVID coupled with the prior trade war discussions and the, the, the sorts of geopolitical dynamics we've seen are putting a lot of focus as your Google search from last evening showed on the topic. Um, and hopefully what they're doing is putting some thoughtful energy behind all of that thinking as well. So, I mean, in, in the finance world, what, one of the things we've done is to actually break down some, some silos in corporates to help people like procurement, finance, marketing, and sales talk to each other because the finance piece touches, you know, crosses all of those silos. So I think there's some, some thoughtful energy going into the whole discussion around supply chains. Um, I think some of the thinking that's going on around supply chain visibility and traceability of goods end to end across supply chains will be all to the good. And certainly one of the issues uh, we're focusing on not now in particular in the context of COVID is the whole question of supply chain resiliency and concentration risk in terms of sources of supply, whether it be at the level of a country or at the level of a particular enterprise as the tsunami in Japan showed in terms of the Apple supply chain some years back. Uh, where one Japanese supplier was adversely impacted and it, it you know, ground the Apple supply chain to a halt for some period of time. So we're certainly seeing those discussions uh, in, in, in this environment, and I think that's uh, necessary and constructive, and I think there's some thoughtful energy going against all of those questions. In fact, GTPA is involved in doing some very interesting work with Bloomberg and the New Economy Forum around supply chain res resiliency and how you better engage SMEs in that uh, process. Uh, and in sourcing practices of large corporates, um, including a, a very uh, sort of globally reaching and large uh, survey uh, at the SME level, at the multinational level, and at the level of public sector and government. So all that to say, they're not broken, they're bent, they're going to reconfigure, 
but what we'll see is commerce coming to the fore, agility coming into focus, and probably some creativity across the physical, financial, and data supply chains. That's great. Thank you. Jean-Francois, please. Yes, thank you. So uh, to echo what Alexander just said, I will concentrate on the physical supply chain and uh, I will uh, concentrate even more to the uh, aeronautics supply chain. So you know that uh, the uh, aeronautics uh, um, activity has been deeply impact, impacted by the, <coughs> sorry, by the COVID-19. Uh, airlines uh, are just surviving and we don't know for how long. If, if there is a lockdown again, we, we are in, in deep uh, uh, distress. And uh, uh, the problem is that this is going to deeply increase the cost of transportation by plane. The, this is the first consequence. And then going back to uh, previous uh, prices, previous costs, uh, should be probably very difficult. Uh, and in the meanwhile, uh, the industry, uh, which is uh, uh, committed to uh, provide the, the materials of the planes, basically, uh, is more or less uh, at risk. Uh, and even some probably some subcontractors, so the ecosystem is going to be hit globally. So we'll see what happens, but uh, uh, you know the, the, the global supply chain, as it was already said, is probably not broken. But the air part of it uh, is uh, uh, deeply at risk today. Thank you, uh, Karim. To you, please. Thank you, Nick. Uh, well, I believe. <laughs> Well, one has to consider which supply chain are we looking at, what type of supply chain we're talking about. So, I see the supply chain today are broken because the way I see it, the supply chain is a physical run, information flow, optimization, and actuation. So, and there are connections between the physical run and informa how information flows, how people interact, how companies interact, and businesses are going and so on. Um, supply chains today have very incremental nature and they can't keep up neither with pressure because the route that information flows is broken. Uh, the physical logistical route is broken as well as all uh, have uh, mentioned. So in that sense it's broken. But in, in, in the larger, in the broader sense of a supply network, no, of course not. As long as there are businesses, there is trade and there is finance, there is business going to be done through a supply chain. But the thing is, it's taking a new shape, a more responsive, more innovative shape of integrated finance, integrated commerce, integrated contracting, integrated procurement, integrated marketing into one one very diversifying our supply chain if it's going to respond to the challenge of this century to come. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go into, I, well, we have a couple of questions from Lisa McCauley, but I'd like to get through this first, um, this first uh, round of questioning first. Um, so uh, question two, um, amid the many challenges that business face, well, where do the new opportunities lie? And what are the organizational and attitudinal characteristics that will enable companies to adapt successfully? What can government do to help? Hugo, please. Uh, keep borders open, not starting any trade wars, trying to iron out our differences. I think that's the most governments can do. The supply chain, the suppliers, buyers, and the intermediates, uh, we are quite flexible and uh, adaptable uh, to anything possible unless we have uh, uh, embargoes, uh, restrictions uh, where we cannot in. I mean, the world is full today already of such. Look, uh, where we can or still are allowed to ship to Russia. Uh, we have restrictions with Iran, which are... Uh, so from Switzerland, we supply a lot of pharmaceuticals and an ant, which we still can supply over there. It's very complicated. Uh, I have a client who supply constantly to Ukraine. We have guarded, uh, armed and guarded uh, services to, 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 to supervise uh, trucks, etc. 
I mean, we have already a lot of complicated places in the world where we still supply. I mean, in Yemen, MMM, the, we are still supplying. Uh, there, the you know, army is keeping certain ways open, etc., to 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 at least ship the essentials for people need to live every day. So, the government's uh, less fights, less uh, interference uh, with this, and I think we are good. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think that the government itself within the supply chain can bring so much. Now, low, low duties, uh, no uh, excess duties, and uh, especially no restrictions in exchange of goods and people. Thank you. Jean-Francois. Yes, so I would agree with Hugo for the, the borders. Uh, you know, the, the other problem is that uh, you have two options, basically, like in aerospace, in aeronautics, Either you concentrate with big and big six uh, centers, or you spread it over all the world. And the, the point, for example, for the Silk Road of the Chinese is going to concentrate along the, the, this road, a lot of stuff. And uh, uh, there will be growth along this road, but uh, not sure that there will be a, go a global growth then. Uh, at least the, 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 the flux of goods will increase. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, the supply chain globally with the companies, with the uh, uh, working force and so on, it's not sure at all that uh, there will be an increase. So uh, diversifying for me would be spreading it over, all over, and not concentrated on one zone of the world, which is uh, uh, belted, uh, you know. Uh, basically, this is what I would say. Thank you. Alexander, please. Thank you, Nick. A couple of things for me. I mean, I would suggest there are a couple of opportunities that have already come to light, even in the context of COVID, which is the ability to quickly reconfigure supply chains. You know, we've heard stories of companies reconfiguring to produce and supply PPE or to shift to vaccine testing and production. So, I mean, that, that agility piece, I think, is going to be something companies are going to be thinking about more as potentially as part of their business continuity uh, planning process. Um, just from a from an attitudinal, attitudinal perspective, the thing I would highlight is just maybe by way of a short anecdote, which is to say that there are some companies, particularly large buyers, who see supply chain management as primarily a cost-cutting exercise, a margin compression exercise, and a how much can I get out of my suppliers kind of exercise. Um, there are others who look at it a bit differently, and I remember a, a corporate um, in, in, the, in, in the United States some years back when I was chairing a panel for a group of people who actually refers to their supply chain finance program as a supplier wellness program because they recognize that the success of their supplier community feeds directly into the success of that corporate. And so that shift in attitude from an exercise in market power to this more collaborative dynamic, I think is probably very healthy uh, and something we may be, we may be seeing more of as, as we start to realize more and more about the linkages of sort of mutual survival. Um, from a uh, related to that, I think the greater attention to ESG factors, as I mentioned earlier, uh, supply chain visibility from end to end, um, authenticity of product. I mean, if you think about things like palm oil that flow through supply chains and that have historically been substituted with lower grade product or non sustainably sourced product partway through the supply chain trip. Uh, and now we're looking at validating the origin and the delivery of the same um, palm oil sort of shipment or, or, or product across the supply chain so that it is sourced on a sustainable basis. So those kinds of practices that are a bit more thoughtful in terms of the nature of the product being supplied, how it's being transported, shipped, quality being controlled, all those sorts of things. I think there's tremendous opportunity there. From a um, physical supply chain perspective, I think there's some really interesting developments in 3D printing, in the application of artificial intelligence and supply chain management, so-called um, control powers in terms of optimizing supply chain management practices. Um, so I think that that's interesting. The 3D printing piece uh, has very significant implications for the logistics industry and for IP and for things that relate to how the supply chain works itself. Um, from a government and public policy perspective, I think uh, there are a couple of things that we can look at. I would agree 100% with Hugo and my colleagues saying, please, can we have a little bit more sanity among world leaders on some of these issues. Um, 
I think we need a little bit of a little bit more principled, thoughtful, and courageous leadership in this respect. Um, more broadly than just a supply chain conversation. But I do think there's some concrete things that can be done. For example, providing additional uh, risk mitigation and financing capacity across supply chains to enable trade to flow. So while we're all talking about COVID at the moment, we also are thinking cautiously and thoughtfully, hopefully, about the sort of coming out of COVID and thinking about what a recovery might look like and what a post-COVID reality might look like. And that type of thinking can't get lost as as part of that sort of policy dialogue. <clears throat> Thank you, Karim. To you, please. Thank you, Nick. Um, first part of opportunity. Um, I think one of the biggest opportunities now is to recognize that supply chain exists outside of any organization. So um, th there has been quite a lot of uh, talks and research, even into okay, let's optimize the supply chain in one organization. Every organization does that. Um, every <laughs> organization. But the thing is, the supply chain itself is outside any organization, but and bigger than any organization. And that has to be addressed. It's, it's, I believe that the supply chain of the future is a subscription-based network. So you, every company has to be attached to such networks not the other way around. And this might be uh, too hypothetical, but in fact, it encompasses visibility, it encompasses uh, optimization, direct uh, uh, supply, um, direct demand, assessment, uh, readily available assessment, dry runs, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, when it comes to government, well, this shouldn't be closing borders for certain, as everybody has said. You know, this is crazy. It puts even economic risk. Um, the second thing is that we have to recognize that any network is regulated by regulations. And regulations are national, not internationally agreed, very hardly internationally agreed. Um, for, for example, when it comes to finance, it's, um, to, to regulations differ so much. When it comes to common and commercial loans, when it comes to this and this and this and that, well, even if technology, even if businesses want to and can uh, overcome shortcomings, we have to be allowed to do so by governments, which is not to say to deregulate, no, but to lessen the extent of controllability. Things had, have to be done in a different way, in a more innovative way. And innovation comes with risk, less control. Thank you. Third question in this opening section, and we'll move on to, to something a little less structured. What is the role for innovation and technology as supply chains evolve once again? And if you look ahead to 2025, what are the big changes that you anticipate seeing? Hugo. I definitely believe that the digitalization is our biggest challenge within the supply chain, uh, connecting uh, digital with each other, standardized in a certain way. Uh, I think we spend a lot of money. Uh, uh, you mentioned before supply chain visibility, uh, although we all have computers, and I mean, uh, if you send it UPS, you may have maybe as a, a, a certain visibility on it. I'm not making any publicity, but all these integrators uh, for small parcels and so you, you see what's happening, uh, which is uh, maybe 5% of the market and the rest, uh, we are still in the dark. Uh, there is a lot of communication within, etc. So I guess uh, the digitalization uh, will help in the future. Uh, compared to the financial sector, uh, I presume that uh, the logistics and the supply chain execution sector is way behind in digitalization and integration between the different parties. It's too complex, it's still too expensive. And uh, due to complexity of it, unfortunately, uh, uh, technical providers are not uh, 
really getting into the digital market of the supply chain. Uh, there are some solutions, but nothing uh, is as good if I compare with the financial sector, where uh, things have been very much advanced in digitalization. But in uh, logistics, everybody is uh, running around with his own software. Uh, very often, they are not connected, uh, very complicated interfaces and interchanges. I mean, if you exchange uh, cargo between two countries, you have an average today between 15 and 23 different documents to be issued, import, export, transportation, insurance, uh, whatever comes with it. And uh, the level of this digitalization uh, will change completely in the next five years. Uh, we will see new solutions. And, uh, I believe uh, billions will be saved in the future in having uh, a better digitalization of this part. Thank you. Alexander, to you, please. Thank you, Nick. And, and Hugo, actually, let me make you feel a little bit better, which is to say that the, the reality in the financial sector is a, a probably almost as painful as what you live in the logistics side, because, in fact, in, in maybe in retail banking and some other areas, there's some really interesting advantages and advances in digitalization. But in trade finance, which is what we should be talking about in the context of trade and supply chains, we still use paper. Um, the flow of paper across the banking system takes sometimes very frequently, I was going to say sometimes, but frequently takes longer uh, than the flow of a ship crossing the Atlantic of the Pacific and getting cargo to its destination. So very often the cargo arrives before the paper is shuffled through the banking system. So we're also wrestling with this problem. Uh, we are looking at probably 35 to 45 pieces of paper per transaction from different sources, uh, which is something like 200 billion pages per year. Uh, and so we're also looking at this whole digitization space as something very significant. So I completely agree with you in terms of one of those uh, being a key innovation and particularly looking into 2025. One of the things that has happened as a direct result of COVID is that some of those papers that actually enable flow of um, trade and flow of cargo across borders were stuck in warehouses in China and India at post lockdown. And the finance people had to then figure out how do we make these transactions see the light of day and sort of continue when we can't get a hold of this paper that represents things like ownership and title to the goods, ability to clear customs, all of those things. And so the industry has now come together. In fact, the ICC just issued a guidance note on this some time back saying, or sorry, a, a paper, I should say, not a guidance note on this, actually describing how the largest financial institutions have found ways to adjust policy and adjust procedure to work in a quasi-digital environment. So I think there's some, some, hopeful signs at this point, and I hope we don't regress uh, once things kind of stabilize a little bit. Um, I do think that there's a lot of thought to be given to the election of the new director general of the WTO at the moment, which will impact the way a lot of this regulatory and international institution um, context starts to evolve. Um, and I do think that uh, a lot of the legal standing and the standards around digital documentation, and digital content needs to be given some thought as well. Now, there are some promising developments. There is, uh, you know, there are a number of financial consortia that look to enable trade and supply chain, and that will then help SMEs to better engage, help us reach deeper into the so-called last mile of supply chains and reach uh, micro enterprises as well as SMEs. And then uh, also address the whole business of digitization a bit more holistically beyond just the finance piece into the international trade uh, process more broadly. So I think there's some, some promising signs there that we just need to uh, ensure continue in the right direction. Uh, thank you. Jean-Francois, to you, please. Yes, so uh, continuing what I said before for the previous question, um, my company is going to start very, very soon. So I mean... Uh, very beginning of uh, January, uh, a, a big project, 325 million euros to make a family of big airships uh, for transportation of goods, point to point, 60,000 uh, kilometers of range without refueling, filled with hydrogen and with payloads uh, from 10 to 1,000 tons. Uh, a family of four, in fact, this is 10, 100, 500, and 1,000 tons. So we will begin with the 100 tons. Uh, so zero emission, of course. 
uh, uh, all safety and security, so in the economy of the hydrogen, to not to be bothered by the ecologists, of course. Uh, and uh, uh, no hangar. This is the main, uh, the biggest problem of the airship. You know, uh, today, if you if you want to to have an airship, you need a hangar, and the hangar is about uh, 100 million euros. So we will get rid of the hangar, and uh, we will go point to point. So we can see this, uh, uh, as I said, with uh, uh, unconcentrating uh, the. Uh, the global logistics uh, worldwide. We can go anywhere, we can land anywhere, whatever the weather, all weather. <clears throat> you know, the, the basic plan is to, to be able to fly three and, uh, 364 days a year, 24 over 24, 24 over 7. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Karim, please. Thank you, Anik. I think I agree with uh, my colleagues here. The, um, the challenge is actually automation. And automation encompasses automated uh, decision making. And for that, you need to understand the data coming in and coming out. And to need uh, and to understand how logistics on, on ground uh, work, and how finance work as well. So how to automate decision making and execution of orders, uh, execution of our um, processes and so on and so forth and integration also integration between what traditionally are uh, called supply chain and field operations and trade finance because more or less these are two different fields altogether but the without any of them it does not work the supply chain just stops to work um, this is what our company works on at the moment, uh, not at transportation, we integrate with that, uh, but we don't handle it ourselves, because transportation, as uh, Jean-Francois said, is a huge challenge, a huge challenge, it needs to be addressed. And I believe uh, automation has to be addressed in that as well. So you, you don't just, you need to click a button and the thing works. This will take some time, but uh, I think this will be one of the greatest challenges to be addressed in the next month, yes. Thank you, Karim. Uh, I thought what we'd do uh, for the rest of the session is, is to give, while well, giving people an opportunity to post questions, also mm -hmm. for the panel to, uh, to respond to each other somewhat. So I was going to start with Karim, and I will in a moment. Before I do that, I actually wanted to put to everybody on the panel two questions raised by uh, Lisa McCauley. Uh, in the chat function. One, how do we integrate more SMEs into the supply chain? Um, and two, how do we address the failure to mesh of, on the one hand, trade rules, and then on the other hand, supply chain regulations? Can I, um, can I ask Hugo to take that question first, please? I mean, uh, due to uh what we said before, complication and especially also protectism, it is difficult uh, more and more uh, to, to follow all these rules. I guess uh, what we are doing with our clients, we make panels, geographical panels, we talk together and I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, today, uh, you have to label in Chinese, uh, if you ship, for example, out of France perfumes to China, uh, in Russia, you need Russian labels. Uh, so you start to label stuff, you don't even know what you put uh, on because you cannot read it. Yeah, and Nothing is moving uh, if this is not on it. We have today, uh, 1st of October, out of France, a non-French company cannot be exporter anymore very strange situation but uh, since 2016 France is planning to implement that it's 1st of October today so we have major problems again for small and middle-sized companies the big ones uh, are geared in uh, if you buy something in France and you want to export it yourself and maybe you don't want to show in a French exporter that uh, or producer who is your client in another area 
you are actually stopped because as a non-European company, you cannot share, uh, be anymore an exporter of records. So you have to find intermediates, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I still cannot see any good out of such rules then to protect uh, the market. And uh, so with this, we have today all over the world new specifications. You mentioned before new VTO director, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The more we talk in VTO, the more regulations we get locally in the different countries. And there is, uh, this is not synchronized. I mean, look at uh, the declaration of uh, hazardous goods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have international regulations to do so, but once you hit the country, America has different rules. Then Singapore or China, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, yes, it makes it complicated for small and medium-sized companies to keep up with all this. And uh, the link in between will be done mostly by the logistics and transport industries, uh, which supply additional uh, help and support mm, to the shippers and uh, the receivers, which uh, unfortunately very often is very badly paid within the industry. Uh, as a lawyer, uh, you charge your hours and uh, normally uh, the transport industry has to solve all these problems on behalf of shippers and consignees too. Uh, being included very often just in the shipping price, which is on the benchmark, etc., etc. So, um, uh, definitely in the future we need that uh, if we want to support small and medium uh, size companies and their trade. We need transparency on this uh, and uh, the, the reduction of protectionism in the various areas. Thank you. Uh, Alexander, please. Thank you, Nick. So, I mean, the thing with the SME uh, engagement in international trade and supply chains is it's a long-standing question, right? Uh, I think we know collectively that SMEs probably represent the greatest sort of group of job creators on the planet, whether you're an OECD economy or whether you're developing an emerging market in South Asia or Africa, the SME segment in your country is probably the most, if not, you know, one of the most, if not the most important business segment there from an employment creation perspective and also maybe surprisingly from a GDP contribution point of view. So it's definitely an important segment to target. Um, Perhaps ironically, it's also the most underserved segment from an education training perspective, from a competency and development perspective. It's an area we're looking at at GTPA as well as is ISO aligned certification and professionalization of practice. Um, but there's also the business of access to finance, which is again one of these perennial competitive challenges. Uh, there are realities that SMEs face challenges in terms of compliance uh, and regulatory expectations. And so all of that, and I've just recently done a presentation at the WTO for the MSME uh, working group there on this very question, is we know what the, the challenges are. They are recurring challenges. What we need to do is create an enabling, enabling environment for SMEs to more easily engage in trade, whether it's directly or whether it's indirectly by supplying to domestic companies that aggregate and then supply into supply chains. Um, we need to make uh, some of the technical com uh, complexity more attainable to SMEs. But you won't, in the end, you won't force an SME to trade if they don't want to, right? So you, you can create the enabling environment, you can connect them to supply chains, you can offer training and competency and liquidity and support and all those sorts of things. But it has to become uh, commercially compelling. And the founders who are often not finance or not logistics technical experts have to then be persuaded that, pursuing opportunities in international markets makes sense. And that's partly an awareness raising exercise and partly an education exercise, and then putting them in an environment where they can actually execute on those things. Thanks. Uh, Jean-Francois, please. Yes. Sorry to start with a joke, but uh, the fate of a good SME is to, be gone, to become a, good, a big company. Uh, so uh, you see the, the point is, uh, you, you should start with a small company, start up, then grow up. And then, you know, because of questions of cost, of uh, cost reduction, competitiveness, and compet 
and competition around the world, then you, you absolutely need to increase your capital, to increase your surface, to increase your market, and you, and you become the big one. If you don't, you need to merge with other small uh, and medium companies or big ones because you have taken over, but they, this is life. Uh, so, I'm sorry not to say more. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Karim, please. Thank you. I'm first to reduce the cost of doing business for SMEs. The thing about business is to generate revenue, to generate jobs. And now corporates can do that, that means cannot because the cost is very high and the complexity is very high. So they don't have access to financing and even if they do, they spend it on just preparing things to get going. So governments answering that question have to agree. They will never agree. Let's just face that. They haven't agreed before and they don't for long. So just let them allow, they are required to allow businesses to do business in an easy way. That's it. And for a supply chain to integrate this, the unit of work, and that's why I talk of networks, because the unit of, net, uh, of work, these networks should be smaller than a corporate. Direct supply chains are actually uh, up to four times cheaper, but um, the supply chains today are filled with intermediaries. So they make lots of costs, very cost and efficient maneuvers to get so the network more complicated and uh, not so well connected. This affects the SMEs as well, as well as the return on it. Karim, thank you very much. We only hey, have a... Yeah, please, please. Do you mind if I just jump in very quickly? I think Jean-Francois and I should stick around and have a virtual glass of wine here because <laughs> one of the things that's a reality, certainly in Canada and certainly in parts of the economies where I engage, is that an SME will never become a large company. Um, there is such a thing as a lifestyle company, which is founded by a family and maybe maintained for one or two, maybe three generations. And it's basically about paying the bills, buying a nice vacation home and making sure people have nice cars and, and so on. They, they, their intent is not to grow to a large business. And when you start looking at emerging market SMEs, they also are not likely to, to attain that or even be thinking about that. And so there is, I agree, there's a textbook version of kind of the growth passive path of a company and the, the, the life cycle of a company. But there's that whole segment of SMEs that will never be more than an SME, uh, and for very good reason. And so, and that, and that's where the, the bulk of the economic value creation is, and that's where the bulk of the inclusion challenge is. Um, and it's also a critical component of supply chains globally that we need to think about in these dialogues. Thank you. Uh, I've got one final final question from IP Value Chain Services and IP again from from Lisa. Uh, which of our panel would like to take that on? IP as in uh, intellectual property. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, connecting value chains, any value chain, is very difficult using today's supply chain. Connecting IP value chains is remarkably difficult because of non-agreement by government. Okay. So. Thank you. I'm afraid we are actually out of time. Uh, uh, races and we finish on time. So I'm going to have to bring the curtain down on the panel now. Lisa, thank you for all your questions. Jean-Francois, Hugo, Alexander, Karim, thanks so much. Really interesting discussion. I wish we could have gone on longer. And thank you to those who, uh, who joined us and, and submitted questions. Uh, have a really interesting rest of, uh, of the uh, conference. Enjoy it. And thanks very much for joining us. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Nice meeting you all. Bye-bye.